Thank you. Um, pour nos participants qui sont en Zoom, je m'appelle Cynthia Afritujo. Je suis le responsable de communication et de plaidoyer chez PN Africa. Um, J'aimerais indiquer qu'il y a l'option pour des prestations. Donc, si vous voulez entendre en français, um, allez au bas de l'écran et choisissez l'interprétation et sélectionnez français et c'est parti. Est-ce que c'est bon? Ok, donc, um, I'll continue in English uh, because I've indicated that there's an interpretation uh, option for them to hear the French interpretation. And so sometime last year, we started the Open Parliament Engagement and Networking in West Africa project, um, which sought to, among other things, facilitate networking among parliamentary monitoring organizations in West Africa. And it's also aimed at strengthening parliamentary openness across the sub-region through a legislative transparency tool. And due to your hard work, we are just a step away from that second objective, which is the launch of the Open in a Parliament Index in West Africa. So, Before um, we dive into the discussion, um, can someone volunteer to pray with us? Okay. Please, shall we pray? Father, we thank you for today, oh God. You said where two or three are gathered in your name, right there you, the Lord is. As you are here to deliberate about Ghana and beyond the borders, you know that you are with us. Help us, O oh God, to achieve every purpose and help us at the end of the day to make an impact in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. I'd welcome our executive director who will do a brief presentation on the project. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, Gilbert and the team, I guess you can allow me access so I can share my screen. Um, Professor the Deputy Speaker of the Parliament of Ghana, um, Honorable Member of the Parliament of Ghana, the Honorable Okujetua Blackwa, together with a couple of other uh, Honorable Members of Parliament from other countries joining in. Um, at the, to the start of the program, our registration indicated a little over 250 people registering across the continent. Uh, I could see about 91 of them in the call at the moment with people ranging from members of parliament, members from civil society organizations, staff of parliament, particularly in the region, but also civil society partners uh, within, uh, within West Africa who have this uh, index focusing quite heavily on. My role is simple, um, to be able to do a quick deep dive into, you know, the uh, key areas of the Africa Open Parliament Index, of course, without announcing the score, because, of course, the score gets announced after the Right Honorable Deputy Speaker has declared this launched. Uh, and I hope that my, I, I will not be tempted to say things that would give uh, hints away uh, while I do my presentation. But this is basically about the Africa Open Parliament Index, and Regina gave an awesome indication around um, how the PMO network started, where we have come to, the organizations that are a part of, and uh, towards launching this index. Presentation, I'll do a brief introduction. I'll speak about the Africa Open Parliament Index. We'll talk about the countries assessed in this OPI 2021 and the methodology, but of main results uh, and the other conversation that goes on in there for the second part when we actually, you know, present those. So if you look at um, this slide, uh, a pictorial bit of all the things that Regina, uh, Dave, Dr. Kobe, and everybody had said about democracy, parliaments in you know, and the challenges that we are facing. So we acknowledge that parliaments are important branches in our democratic architecture. Yes, we acknowledge that they do legislation, they do representation, they do oversight. Yes, we acknowledge that they are the fulcrum around which, you know, functional democracies revolve. Yes, but we also know that democracies are now very heavily challenged. You know, um, institutions are opaque. Uh, 
there is loss of public confidence in, in, our, in our respective institutions. Um, there is a distance between the public and the institutions that represent them, including um, you know, parliaments. There's excessively strong arms uh, by the executive branch so over concentration of power and sometimes make legislative branch look like a subordinate arm of government when it is supposed to be a co-equal branch of government. Of course, in West Africa, we are facing coup d'etats uh, in countries in West Africa, which is big, three out of 15 men instead of a co-equal branch. There's loss of credibility and, and legitimacy by the people generally going around, although parliament be better than that. Uh, in some countries, the institutions are seen as untouchable institutions with members who are untouchables. Nobody can talk about them. Nobody can say anything about them. And this even beca became worse during the period of COVID and with the coups happening, because like Regina rightly said, parliaments are the most, uh, the, the arm of government that suffers the most when there is you know, military overthrow. And during COVID, we saw that members of parliament had to play double and triple roles, you know, uh, being frontline people, people and all of that, making emergency laws and what have you. But the good thing is that there is a growing uh, state of open governance conversations around the globe and in, in, in Africa. Um, open parliament conversations are going on. Uh, of course, access to information is becoming a big thing on our continent. In fact, 75% of all countries in Africa currently have either a right to information law, a right to information regulation. There is a pending in their respect respective countries, which is a good high uh, from Africa. So the conversations have been good. And for this reason, we thought that, okay, would it be good? It would be good if we're able to have a tool that will periodically measure parliaments, the, the legislative arm of government, so far as openness is concerned. And so far as we are concerned, when we talk about open parliament or parliamentary openness, we're talking about parliaments that are transparent and accountable to the people that they serve and parliaments that encourage citizens' participation in their work. So the three key elements of accountability and civic participation plays out heavily for us in these conversations. Now, the idea is to have an objective and an independent ranking tool that will be released once every two years to rank parliaments across the continent. But of course, we would notice whether OPI 2022 is for the whole of Africa or it is just for a part of Africa. And for us as civil society organizations, this is supposed to contribute to the institutional strengthening efforts of parliaments because we believe that once we are able to identify some of the success stories, other parliaments can learn from that. Once we are able to highlight the gaps within a particular parliament, there will be efforts to co-create reforms, transformations, you know, with civil society and other partners so that things can change. And once we make recommendations, it can lead to further research. It can lead to, you know, improved advocacy. It can lead to subsequent reforms that would help in building parliaments and making them better open. So the Africa OPI has three main objectives. First is to strengthen parliamentary institutions towards the advancement of parliamentary openness across national, subnational, and regional parliaments. And you notice that the index has been built in such a way that it can measure national parliaments, but in countries like Nigeria, Kenya, and Co, where they have devolved you know, legislation, it can also measure regional parliaments or uh, 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 parliaments within the various states you know, among themselves, but it can also measure transnational legislatures. So at some point, we should be able to check on ECOWAS parliament as against, you know, the Eastern African Legislative Assembly as against their Southern African counterparts in, in doing this. It is also intended to identify, compare, and exchange knowledge and best practices among parliaments and among civil society organizations with parliaments. So when we identify what's working well, what may not be working well in country B, we can exchange. We also want to see a system where society is thoroughly engaging with parliaments so that the needed reforms that need to come up are also coming up and coming up fast. And also to foster collaboration between civil society and parliaments towards achieving the principles of open parliament, thereby providing a platform for amplifying open parliament initiatives. Uh, so like I said earlier on, this has been developed in such a way that it can compare and rank national parliaments among themselves, sub-national parliaments, and even regional parliaments. And it has been done in such a way that it can be applied everywhere on the continent. Um, 
Regina has already mentioned this. This was developed by uh, a collaborative work of the African Parliamentary Monitoring Organizations Network, uh, which PN Africa is happy to coordinate and host in our Accra office. Uh, but it's involved, it includes the African Parliamentary Press Network, the Ghana Center for Democratic Development, the Zelendo Trust in Kenya, the Pan African Parliament Civil Society Forum, which is hosted by the University of Pretoria Center for Human Rights, and then the Parliamentary Monitoring Group, which is based in South Africa. But we enjoyed amazing technical support from Maria and her team at Directorio Legislativo in Argentina. And of course, we are grateful to the National Endowment for Democracy for supporting this work. So this made in Open Parliament Index, 2022's Open Parliament Index. First of all, it's important to note that this one focused on West Africa. And for those of you on the call who may not be from Africa, Argent, West Africa is, object, is based on our West African regional program. This was focused on West Africa as a way to be able to test the index and to see, you know, what works and what does not work, even as we look forward to scale it. That's my, uh, has been colored green. The countries in West Africa area that has been colored Green. In fact, if you look very closely, you see that even outside the green, just on top of my word count, you can find Cape Verde there somewhere. The green is popping up uh, 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 in the ocean somewhere where Cape Verde, the island country, is located. But why did we choose West Africa also? Because the dynamics in West Africa are quite interesting. Uh, first of all, West African countries make up about a quarter of... Uh, African countries. And so to do it in West is that we are covering one continent. The, the region also has a vision, and that allows us to test this if it's successful in West Africa. It could be planted anywhere else and to be successful. As you may be aware, West Africa has 15 countries uh, out of the 55 um, African states. Um, five of us here are Anglophone eight francophone and two lusophone countries, you know, doing Portuguese. Uh, and also in that same context, within the parliamentary conversation and the parliamentary language, three of these West African countries have by is that they have a two chamber parliament and 12 have unicameral parliaments. So 12, uh, uh, a single chamber parliament. Some of them practice a pure presidential system. Some of them have something that, you know, looks like a parliamentary system. Some of us, you know, like Ghana likes to tout is a hybrid system among many other things. So it's, it's made very interesting nuances. And like we have observed earlier, there are three coup d'etats or countries under military rule in, in West Africa, which means that if the index is tested within that context, we can be able to see what the results would look like. So these are the countries in West Africa. And this is just to give an indication of which countries were involved and which countries were not involved. Now, 13 countries in West Africa were ranked in this particular index, 13 out of the 15. The two which were not ranked are Mali and Guinea Conakry. Mali and Guinea Conakry. And they are on the extreme right of your screen. The reason why Mali and Guinea Conakry were not ranked is that there are countries that had coup d'etats before the end of 2021, because we are measuring parliament's openness as at close of 2021. And so if these two countries' parliament did not complete the cycle as at the end of 2021, we thought it would not be equal measure to have them also measured. However, you notice that Burkina Faso is part of the three countries under military rule. Burkina Faso's um, coup happened in early 2022, January of 2022, which meant that their parliament actually had an entire cycle and so could be shared. The 12 countries which were included in this index, for those of us who are not too familiar with the countries in West Africa, are, um, and, and forgive me, I made a, a terrible mistake in uh, the very first country. Yes, um, um, forgive, forgive me on that. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's a, very, a very terrible, terrible mistake. That's supposed to be Togo. That's Togo. So Togo, Niger, Benin, Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire are the Francophone countries. Um, Anglophone countries, 
Nigeria, Ghana, Sierra Leone, and the Gambia. Two Lusophone countries, Cape Verde and Guinea-Bissau. And like I mentioned, Burkina Faso was also included, although it is under military rule for the reasons that I had uh, uh, given. And I'm sure that my colleagues in, in, in Lome and, and in the rest of Togo will forgive me for this uh, horrible uh, mistake. Uh, now the methodology, the methodology. And I think this is a very important part to explain how we came about the work that we did. So the first thing that is that during the period when I described what parliamentary openness means or what open parliament means, we indicated that there are three indicators, transparency, civic participation, and public accountability. So if you look at the image on your screen, you realize that the issues, which are transparency, civic participation, and public accountability had 18 indicators under transparency, 15 indicators under civic participation, and 11 indicators under public accountability. And to make a 100% score, transparency makes for 35%, participation makes for 35%, and public accountability makes for 30%. If you strike an average of the percentage score granted against the indicator numbers, you notice that on the average, public accountability is actually high by way of the weighting, although it is 30%. Because public accountability is where we talk about, you know, members of parliament and the institution of parliament being accountable to, to citizens, um, followed by civic participation, where civil society, uh, citizens, and everybody, media, and everybody are engaged in the work of parliament. And then, of course, transparency, which talks more about the laws that exist, the uh, uh, implementation of those laws, especially access to information laws and what have you. But this index was built with three main source documents in mind. The cardinal one, as you can see on the top, is the Declaration on Parliamentary Openness. The Declaration on Parliamentary Openness is a document that has been agreed to by civil society globally on what makes for an open parliament. But we thought, okay, if we are doing an index and we are just taking from what civil society thinks about an open parliament, we will probably have parliaments coming back and saying, you only looked at it from a civil society perspective, you did not consider us. And so we thought, let's add another document. The Interparliamentary Union or the IPU, which is the Global Association of Parliaments, also have the indicators for democratic parliaments. And so we thought, let's box the civil society bit with parliaments, parliamentary organizations, and their own indicators for democratic parliament. And let's lace it all nicely together with the open government partnerships, open parliament policy area, so that it becomes universal, so that parliaments can see themselves in this, so that civil society can see itself in this, but ultimately towards the goal and the objectives that I highlighted earlier on. So the three main indicator areas Yes. When we say transparency, when we say civic participation and public accountability, what do we mean in the context of the OPI? So in the context of the OPI, a transparent parliament is a parliament that discloses more information, improves the legal or institutional framework to guarantee the right to information, improves the quality of parliamentary information disclosed to the public, and improves the, improves the transparency of its decision-making processes and systems. A parliament that encourages civic participation is one that creates or improves opportunities, processes, or mechanisms for the public to inform or influence decisions. A parliament that creates, enables, or improves participatory mechanisms for minorities or underrepresented groups. And a parliament that enables a legal environment that guarantees freedom of assembly, association, and peaceful protest. Then an accountable parliament is one where the men parliament are answerable to citizens because it is really what it is. You know, members are, are elected to represent citizens on their performance and the integrity of their conduct while in office, but not just the members of parliament, the institution of parliament, where the parliament itself reports on their institutional performance regularly in a and in a transparent manner. So it looks at MPs, 
it looks at also the institution of parliament. But ultimately, parliamentary openness is an institutional thing because it takes the entire institution of parliament to make things open, transparent, and what have you. So now, just to be able to take you through the six-step processes that we went through to arrive at the 2022 OPI. The first were the pre-development engagement stage. And in this pre-development engagement stage, like Maria had indicated, we had several conversations with the Latin American uh, network for legislative transparency because they've been together as a network for many years, but they've also implemented an index for well over a decade. And they've done that once every two years. And so we wanted to learn the best practices. But we also agreed and understood that the South-South collaboration was very important, just like Maria said. So for a whole year, the whole of last year, was full of engagement with the team in Argentina uh, uh, to be able to have a good understanding of this. And like Maria indicated, in some instances, they send people to Accra to meet with the working group and what have you. Then we also started engaging our partners within West Africa because West Africa is the focus. And so 11 countries out of the 15 West African countries had the OPI team members physically visiting those countries. In our physical visits, we engage leadership of parliament. So in some parliaments, we met their speakers, like the speakers of the parliament of Ghana, the speaker of the, 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 the president of the National Assembly of Benin. Uh, in some parliaments, you met uh, key parliamentary committees, like in the case of Cote d'Ivoire, in the case of... Um, uh, in the case of uh, uh, Sierra Leone, uh, in some parliaments, you met key parliamentary staffers, you know, the rest of them, so clerks of parliament, secretary generals of parliament, and what have you, to pitch to them this idea and to get their support for this whole process. And we think that that pitching did a lot of magic because, as you may see later on, out of the 13 parliaments that were were assessed, we had civil society responding to the questionnaires from all 13 parliaments, 13 countries. In the case of parliament, we got response from eight out of 13. And for a first index, we thought it was a very big, you know, uh, a progress with eight parliaments participating. In fact, for the remaining parliaments, but for time, we think that they would also be able to have, you know, so some of the parliaments are indicated and you'll see in the full report when it is released, that some of the parliaments indicated that they couldn't finish because, you know, we also have deadlines to go to meet. These engagements also met with civil society organizations in the 11 countries indicated. In all these 11 countries, we supported the creation of what is called a, par a network of parliamentary monitoring organizations in these countries. So civil society organizations that work with parliaments, monitors parliaments and engage parliaments, we shared with them the idea of coming together because it is better when we work together, when we work with parliaments in a unified fashion. And Maria also reiterated uh, that particular point. And so networks were created. Then we came to the development of the indicators. As I indicated, the Declaration of Parliamentary Openness, the IPU indicators, and then the Open Government Partnership you know, principles were all boxed together. We had three main dimension areas as I've indicated, transparency, civic participation, and public accountability. 44 indicators, as were explained uh, under each of these. It was tested. Uh, we had engagement with, you know, group members, engagement with the various parliaments, uh, countries that spoke different languages other than English, also looked at this to be able to make sure that the language is actually uniformed because some terminologies, if not translated effectively, could mean something differently and it would affect it. All of these took place up to the end of April this year. Then in May and June, we set forward to gather the data. Now, these are how data were gathered in their respective countries. Each country presented two completed questionnaires, one from its and one from civil society collective. And so the same questions, but we wanted to open openness. 
and the parliament's perspective of parliamentary. The methodology was developed in such a way that if both submit, we'll be able to assess. If just one submit, we will still be able to assess because we didn't want a situation where if a parliament does not submit, you know, it is not... It, we are any However, it allowed us the opportunity to assess specific parliamentary informations on their own website, public parliamentary information to ensure that information that are sent to us are tight. And every parliament and every civil society in answering the questions, is, so there's an evidence section, there's a comment section, and there's a recommendation section. Located out of the 13, 13 civil society organizations or networks submitted, and out of the 13 parliaments, eight out of 13 actually submitted and further engaged with us, you know, via virtual means and what have you. All of these were calculated uh, using a very, you know, uh, easy system. You know, it's a spreadsheet system. Uh, it's a, a direct mean calculation. And I must say that the transparency of this OPI is such that anybody can assess the assessments, you know, uh, uh, details for your further, you know, assessments or, you know, to be able to test the system. Uh, parliaments can request it to be provided to them. Civil society can request. Individual researchers, media folks can all research to be able to see the back end that informed uh, the data. This has been done in a beautiful way and we've been able to now rank all 13 countries that were assessed in order of their level of openness, which will be introduced to us later on. So we know the country that is the most open in West Africa among the 13, and the country that is considered the least open. The perfect score is 100. And so we would also see whether the winning country is actually any close to 100, or even though it was first, it probably is first among uh, 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 averagely performing parliaments or what have you, and that would also... This meeting is the first of the dissemination exercise stage six where we are launching it after this launch you'll be able to assess the summary of the index on a portal that will be announced as part of this launch so you'll be able to see each country its position how it's called under transparency under civic participation under public accountability and how it's called overall and their respective rankings and this will be used in our engagement for the rest of this week. Next week, the full report in three languages, French, Portuguese, and English, will also be released, which gives a full narrative of the uh, arrangement. The reason we did not want to release the report immediately is that French and Portuguese translations, you know, needed to be done after the you know, the, the, the final reports were ready and wanted to make sure that everybody was assessing it at an equal time. And so that will be released next week. And then there will be further engagement where the networks of civil society organizations in their respective countries are expected now to engage their national parliaments with their results. So the PMO network in Ghana goes to the parliament of Ghana and says, parliament of Ghana, these were our results. We placed X over 13 these are the recommendations. What can we, how can we work together to better it? And like Dr. Kofi announced, there is a, there is a sub grant that will be awarded to civil society, the PMO networks in these respective countries to be able to further these processes in their respective countries. So let me end all of this by saying some thank yous, uh, particularly to parliaments within West Africa, the parliaments of Benin, Gambia, Ghana, Liberia, Niger, Sierra Leone, Senegal and Cote d'Ivoire, which were the parliaments that actually responded uh, um, to this. Parliamentary monitoring organizations, network working group, directorio legislativo, the study in Africa, this has been working around the clock, you know, multiple hours to be able to achieve this. We engage the services of 14 country research associates, you know, in all countries, except the two Lusophone countries who did not have the research associates stationed in the countries. So our Portuguese research associate was not stationed in the countries, but related with them. But apart from that, in all of the countries, there were research associates who were present physically in those countries to coordinate the efforts. We also thank the IPU, the OGP, and the Open Parliament E-Network because we leverage a lot on their material online. The National Endowment for Democracy, certainly for the 
uh, funding support that was given to us, and parliamentary monitoring organizations' networks in Liberia, in Sierra Leone, in Burkina Faso, in Cote d'Ivoire, Gambia, Benin, Niger, Togo, Nigeria, and Ghana, which are the countries that we have supported or worked together with partners to create PMO networks in. And of course, these are some of the country partners that we have worked with. We thank them all so very, very much. Uh, Social Watch Benin, CREFD, uh, National Youth Parliament in the Gambia, Youth Bridge Foundation, um, uh, Institute for Research and Democratic Development, IRED in Liberia, ROTAB in, in Togo, IGR in Sierra Leone, um, uh, ROTAB is in Niger, IGR in, in Sierra Leone, uh, Collective Desassociation, Conte, Limpunité au Togo uh, in Togo, uh, Other People Nigeria, CGD in, in Burkina Faso, uh, Platforma da ONG in, in Cape Verde, and of course, Tininguena in Senegal. We thank you all so very, very much. And so, of course, after we have had the main speech from our guest speaker, the first deputy speaker, we can expect that we will see the final results. But until then, I still have it uh, uh, on my desk, uh, keeping it tight. Thank you so very, very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, I think at this juncture, we will do the panel discussion where um, all our country partners and stakeholders who helped us to achieve this feat would be projected on Zoom because all of them are joining us from Zoom. Please permit me to introduce Mr. Tony M. Um, Mendy. He is the table clerk at the Gambian National Assembly. We also have Mr. Matthias Yene. Yene. He is the executive director of the Institute of Research and Democratic Development, IRED, in Liberia. We have in our midst Mr. Amos R. Maurice from Liberia. He is also the research analyst at the Liberian legislature. And finally, we have John Charles Inji. He is the chairman of the steering committee of the PMO network in Gambia. Um, these are the questions that they will be deliberating on. So we want to know their experience after participating in the process of developing the Open Parliament Index, because these were the partners on the ground to do all the legwork. And so we want to know how and their experience was. And we'd also want to know what they think or how they think the parliament, their national parliaments will benefit from this index. So these are the two major questions that will be asked, but um, it will be asked in group, so. Okay, so I think Mr. Matthias is there. Uh, Mr. Felipe is also there. We. Oui. Madame Blanche Sonon aussi. Ok, on peut, on peut commencer avec nos participants francophones. Donc, euh, oui, parce que j'ai vu ce qui est dans la réunion. Euh, donc, la question, c'est comment pensez-vous que le Parlement bénéficiera de l'indice? Comment pensez-vous que le Parlement bénéficierait de l'indice? How do you think the Parliament would benefit from this index? Our second guest, guest. Okay. All right. S'il vous plaît. Please, you may have. Please, let's go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me first acknowledge that this is a keynote address 
of the Right Honorable Speaker, Right Honorable ASK Babi. I'm only standing in for him because, unfortunately, he had to undertake an official trip to Rwanda and could not be here today. He sends his regards and his compliments. But before I read Mr. Speaker's speech, I, I, I observed, and it's been a long-standing observation, many people who talk about the institutions that suffer when there's a coup d'etat, we only talk about parliament. The press is one of the major victims of repression. The civil society organizations are one of the major victims. So you are here because there's a parliament. You are here because there's democracy. So you and I are in the same and in this together. Sometimes when I listen to some of you, the way you deride democracy, the way you propose that democracy be truncated, I wonder how many of you were here 30 years ago before the constitution came into effect. We either, we are here together. If democracy survives, you survive. If it is truncated, probably you may go along with it. Thank you. <laughs> Madam Chair, Honorable Sami Okujato, the only member of parliament here with me, representatives of parliamentary monitoring organizations, executives of the National Democratic Institute, heads and representatives of CSOs from West African countries, distinguished invited guests, friends from the media, ladies and gentlemen. Considering the fact that this is actually the launch of an open parliamentary index in Africa by this noble institution with the aim of measuring how the various houses of representatives across the African continent perform in the area of transparency, civic participation, and public accountability. I'm delighted and humbled by the honor and privilege extended to me to deliver the keynote address for this occasion. Legislative representation is all about representing and protecting the collective hope and aspirations of the citizenry by parliament, which institution is clothed with enough powers to make laws that will serve this purpose. Parliament is an arena in which the representatives of the people consider matters of public concern and interest and the best ways of mobilizing and sharing resources to meet national aims and aspirations. It is intended to provide a platform for public participation and national governance. This has been found over the period to be best practiced under a democratic system of government, which also gives the people a direct power to determine their choices and guarantees them an unrestricted freedom to express it at all material times. Parliament does this primarily by improving public administration and ensuring that government provides services to the people in accordance with the oft referred to four E's, which are efficiency, economy, effectiveness, and equity. Ladies and gentlemen, it is sad, however, to know that the public is increasingly losing faith in the legislature and politicians in general. They believe and suspect that their collective interest is being sacrificed for personal gains. It is for this reason that I consider this initiative very necessary and timely. It will go a long way to challenge various African parliaments to respond to the collective call of the people. I, in particular, welcome this initiative on the back of the changing trends in democratic governance all over the world, which is seeing the broadening of the scope of parliament. It is in times such as these that we need institutions like yours to keep us on our toes in order to deliver the best parliamentary practices required of us. Parliamentary monitoring organizations play a pivotal role in monitoring and assessing the functioning of parliament of their individual members. It seeks to facilitate and promote public knowledge of and participation in 
parliamentary processes, parliamentary informatics tools, parliamentary informatics tools are being used mainly to aggregate and visualize parliamentary information, which with a growing catalog of citizen engagement tools. Many PMOs work to advance both goals at the same time, enhancing access to parliamentary information while giving citizens the legislate and legislators the tools they need to communicate and collaborate. Considering the objectives of the Open Parliament Index, I am of a strong view that Ghana's parliament is not faring badly at all. For instance, Parliament has begun a speaker's public lecture series to stimulate debate and to debate on the concept of separation of powers, the independence of Parliament, and issues bordering on the interest of the people and how they ought to be addressed by the House. The maiden seminar lecture discussed the applicability of the political question doctrine in Ghana's jurisprudence. It afforded key stakeholders and citizens alike the opportunity to reflect on how parliament can navigate the challenges in the current context of the hung parliament by coming up with a key recommendation for consideration and implementation. Ladies and gentlemen, another area where there have been great progress in the institutionalization of the public hearings on the Auditor General's report through the Public Accounts Committee. The PAC is arguably one of the most important committees of our parliament. The historical origin of the PAC is rooted in the deep traditions of Westminster. Over the years, the tradition of the PAC has been adopted by most parliaments because of its singular attribute as an important watchdog committee, the apex of accountability with oversight over executive spending. The formal function that is spearheaded by the PAC involves not only compliance, but more critically, ensuring value for money in the implementation of policy. Currently, the fundamental question about PACs is framed around how they can ensure the economy, efficiency, and effectiveness of government policies and spending. That is, has policy been carried out effectively, efficiently, and economically? The answers to these questions are the overriding occupation of PACs at present. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, PAC exacts accountability publicly from different agencies of government that are tasked with implementation and execution of policies and programs based on legislative intent. Indeed, the clearest indicator of effective parliamentary performance is gauged by the performance of the PAC. Without exaggeration, the PAC can be viewed as the nerve center of the accountability and oversight functions of parliament. Its relevance and significance cannot be overstated. During the Fourth Republic, our PAC has shed the light of transparency on some of the challenges around our public financial management systems. An important indicator of the effectiveness of PAC and by extension parliament is the acceptance and implementation of the committee or parliament's recommendations. This is where many PACs and parliaments around the world have failed. They do excellent work, produce beautiful and glossy reports, which attract very little government attention. There's no better satisfaction for a PAC than when government takes text to implement its recommendation. Getting recommendations accepted and implemented continue to be one of the biggest challenges of PACs. Allied to the function of PAC, is a critical function every parliament performs, holding governments responsible for their actions and decisions. Parliament is unique in being the only institution with a political mandate from the people to monitor the, the management of the state by government. Parliaments carry out this onerous duty
through their oversight function, which aims to promote people's freedoms and well-being and to improve accountability and transparency in government. Oversight processes assess the impact of government action on society. They help ensure that appropriate resources are provided to implement government programs, identify unintended or negative effects of government policy and actions, and monitor the meeting of national and international commitments. Aside PAC, our standing orders also make room for ministers and other state agencies to be summoned before the House to brief the House on issues relating to their jurisdiction. Another major stakeholder of Ghana's parliament is the media. Oversight over public resources is significantly facilitated by a free press. It is important, therefore, for the legislature to have a good working relationship with the media or press as they perform their functions. Chapter 12 of the Fourth Republican Constitution guarantees the freedom and independence of the media. This saw in 2001, Ghana's parliament unanimously repeal the criminal libel and seditious laws. Article 21.1 of Ghana's constitution provides that all persons have the right to freedom of speech and expression, including the freedom of press and the media, as well as the right to information subject to such qualifications and laws as are necessary in a democratic society. Accordingly, trans the right information to the Information Act and the whistleblower, the media, the House accordingly passed the Right to Information Act and the Whistleblower Act. The media forms a major part of the parliamentary business. Parliamentary proceedings and some committee sittings are open to the media, with the media constantly giving briefings on the closed door engagements. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, another bill that will change the landscape of parliamentary oversight responsibility is the budget bill. This bill seeks to give a more inclusive role to parliament right from the preparation stage to enable the house and all stakeholders to make inputs before it is presented to the plenary for consideration. This is in line with the African Parliamentary Index, API, which was agreed many years ago. This is a set of indicators that shows the level of engagement of selected African parliaments in the budget process in their respective countries. The API has been developed in line with identified businesses and the areas of weakness of partner parliaments, thereby facilitating more structured and targeted capacity building intervention by partners. As a core component of the API, as a core component of the African Parliamentary Strengthening Program for Budget Oversight, API also measures the performance of parliaments in selected African countries on budget oversight. The APSP aims to enhance partner parliaments' ability to carry out their legislative, financial, and oversight representative functions in ways that engender good governance and values of accountability, transparency, and participation, especially in the budget process. Ladies and gentlemen, Ghana strongly welcomes the initiative by the APMO and as it will provide an independent evaluation for the work of various parliaments on the continent. It is one such partnership. Uh, it is in one such partnership and also opened to as part of our parliamentary reforms. I look forward to more collaboration in the years ahead and may Ghana's parliament continue to grow from strength to strength. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Honorable. Uh, this has been a privilege. Thank you. Um, so I think we can move on to the next item, and that is the illustration of the report. Now that it has been launched, we can have a virtual illustration that will be done by our executive director. So. I welcome Mr. Samuel Bing again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Um, I noticed that 
and for 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 those who are online and those of us in the room um i think that with our announced duration and time for the program particularly because of a few hitches here and there we are virtually coming to the end of the time you may probably endure just about 10 more minutes beyond two o'clock so that we can wrap this up and of beyond three o'clock beyond three o'clock um so that of course three o'clock gmt for those of you uh, 10 minutes on top of the hour and uh, um, so that we can be able to have and um Honorable Deputy, first Deputy Speaker, of course, um, I'm not too sure whether I'm going to uh, disappoint you or perhaps confirm the indications from the Right Honorable Speaker's speech that you indicated uh, of hoping that Ghana performs uh, uh, better in, in, in this index. Uh, I noticed that you also in the speech referred to the... Um, the API, I see that our friends from the Africa Center for Parliamentary Affairs, Asepa, Agnes, and Co., who actually uh, um, published the API, you know, are part of the Ghana network. And it's been a long standing work, you know, done over uh, several years. And we're happy that it is going to yield results, you know, in Ghana, just like we've seen other countries also uh, take advantage of it. Um, of course, Agnes is here with the other members of the Ghana PMO network. We can see all the various organizations. Thank you so very much for coming. The GIs of our times, the CDDs of our times, and all other organizations that are here. So this is where I left off in my earlier presentation uh, on the bit about final results. And I am privileged to come back on behalf of the Africa PMO network to announce a few things uh, with regards to how countries fared. So before we go into the overall results, let me take you through the dimensional results, the three main dimensions. I mentioned accountability, civic participation, and uh, 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 public accountability. Public accountability, civic participation, and transparency. And each and every one of these dimensions has results for them put together to give the overall results. Now, I start with transparency. And on our screen is our transparency results. Remember that transparency accounts for 35% of the total score. So yes, per the, OPI, per the OPI, the most transparent parliament in the sub-region is the Ghana parliament, yes. However, you will notice that the Ghana parliament scores 27.71 out of a possible 35. And you would also notice that with 35 being the perfect score, half of 35 is just about 17.5. So you realize that virtually every country except the bottom three, so far as access to information laws are concerned, so far as implementation of those uh, uh, laws are concerned, so far as access to parliamentary internal processes towards making information available are concerned, those things are going somewhat well in West Africa. Of course, we have the top three in this area being Ghana, Cape Verde, and Benin, and the bottom three in this area being Guinea-Bissau, Togo, and Senegal. The only three that fell beyond the halfway mark so far as this is concerned. So that is the transparency indicator. The second indicator or second dimensional area, civic participation. Scoring for accounting for 35% as well. And here you will also notice a very interesting one. Of course, the parliament that allows the most civil society involvement, engagement in its work is the parliament of Cape Verde. Um, yes, and I think Cape Verde de deserves an applause. Um, of course, the top three being Cape Verde, Ghana, and Sierra Leone, uh, one of the other, you know, uh, parliaments that allows a lot of civil society participation. In fact, in the case of Sierra Leone, first deputy speaker, I can indicate that one of the novel things that have been done in, on the continent and even on, in this region is where parliaments have actually signed an MOU with civil society organizations with a goal of setting up a civil society desk in parliament 
there is a department responsible for civil society coordination with parliament to allow for smooth coordination and these engagements you know are ongoing so these are some of the good examples that we uh, intend to show in the in the in the index final narrative report when you see them and we are hoping that parliaments will emulate some of these good practices to make their parliaments best uh, better the, the bottom three guinea-bissau uh, liberia and i must say that when the Parliamentary Doc Documentation Center, the head of the Parliamentary Documentation Center of the Liberian Parliament was speaking. He was one of the people that spoke. He indicated that one of the biggest discoveries they made during this OPI is the fact that they are the only parliament in the region that does not have a functional parliamentary website. The only parliament, the Liberian Parliament. And under civic participation, if you are supposed to provide information to the people in this day and age, you know, a, a parliamentary digital, digital platforms are very key. Of course, we see how other parliaments are using other means. You know, the Parliament of Benin, you know, has uh, uh, the Parliament of Benin, Niger, Burkina Faso have dedicated parliamentary radio stations that broadcast, you know, the proceedings of parliament. You have the Parliament of Sierra Leone and Ghana having um, parliamentary apps, mobile applications, some having fantastic websites. Of course, the Parliament of Guinea-Bissau has a website, a URL that you can log on onto, but basically empty, you know. And so these are some of the things that also needs to be learned. Meanwhile, there are some of the parliaments that have fantastic websites. In fact, in the case of the Parliament of Cape Verde, their website publishes even the Parliament's own budget. Their website publishes or makes provisions for how much members of Parliament are paid the other website makes provisions for several other details that were quite interesting, uh, you know, to, 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 have, to have discovered. Um, to, to have discovered. And for us, and I, I think I agree on that, proactive disclosure of information allows for certain grapevine information to be diminished because information is out there. So we know it. We know when members of parliament tell us that the uh, district assembly common fund is nothing and can do nothing. But if we do not know what the amount of money is to be able to know what it can be used for, there are so many expectations that it can be used for roads and schools, but it cannot. And so these are some of the things that proactive disclosure and continuous engagement with citizens can provide. The third dimensional area, had a joint top between Cape Verde and Sierra Leone. A joint top between Cape Verde and Sierra Leone. And this talks about parliamentary accountability. Um, we, we speak about how parliament discloses information about members of parliament themselves, the institution of parliament, uh, its financials, its, I mean, budgets, you know, all of those accountability related matters that comes up. Of course, the bottom three in this area, Guinea Bissau, Niger, and Benin. So when you put all three dimensions together, you have the final. So 35 plus 35 plus 30 gives you 100%. Uh, 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 percent. But let's look at public accountability again. 30%, which means that the midpoint is supposed to be 15 apart from the joint tops, which are just a little above 15, Sierra Leone and, 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 and Cape Verde, every other country fell below average for public accountability, which talks about how members of parliament are accountable directly to their people, how the institution of parliament is also accountable generally to citizens. And that was the worst area so far as performance in parliamentary openness is concerned. And so now, I have the privilege to take us through the individual country scores. 13th on the list is the Parliament of Guinea-Bissau. The Parliament of Guinea-Bissau. They scored an overall total of 23.36% out of 100. 23.36 out of 100. And 22.36, sorry, out of 100. And you could see the uh, dimensional scores, transparency, civic participation, public accountability out there. Uh, we think that there is so much that can be done so far as the Parliament of Guinea-Bissau is concerned. 
at 12th position is the legislature of Liberia. The legislature of Liberia. It scored 33.65%, just about a third of the available scores. And we could see the dimension so far as transparency, civic participation, and public accountability is concerned. Remember that Liberia has a bicameral parliament, which means that it's a two-chamber parliament. So this is a consolidation of both the Senate, which is the upper chamber of parliament, and the lower chamber of parliament all put together. And when we talk about the absence of a parliamentary website in Liberia, we mean none of the chambers actually has anything online for anybody to be able to refer to. Uh, and the parliament's website has actually been down, as we discovered in the, in the, in the document, for more than a decade. Um, a, a very worrying trend. But we are happy that this had been noticed and immediately there are conversations internally, even when they saw the initial indications of the results. 11th is the parliament of Togo, 36.26%. Um, of course, there are dimensional signs being indicated. And while we go through this, you'll notice that the top right corner, for those of you who are not too familiar where the various countries are located, you see the West African map, and where that country is located is the area in red. So Togo is that area very close to Ghana where this event is actually happening at, and this is the score that Togo had. Togo is a unicameral parliament. At 10th position is the parliament of Niger. The parliament of Niger, 37.15% overall, also falling even below 40%. Uh, the various indicator areas as had been shown um, and Niger is located in the area colored red. At ninth position is the parliament of Senegal. The parliament of Senegal. Yet again, the parliament of Senegal at ninth is where we start crossing the 40% mark we start crossing the 40% mark. The various indicator areas that calculates and adds up to give you a 41.26% is indicated. And Senegal is a beautiful country that is located where the sign is showing red, beautiful Dakar with our friends in the Gambia fully inside of Senegal. So if you are seeing a white inside Senegal, it means that the Gambia is completely inside of, of Senegal. At eighth place, is the legislature of Burkina Faso before the coup. And I think we explained that also, why Burkina Faso was part of this uh, uh, ranking, because their parliament terminated, the current transitional legislature that they have started only at the beginning of this year. And they fall at eighth position with 46.69%. There are various dimensional areas also showing. At seventh position, is the legislature of Cote d'Ivoire, the legislature of Cote d'Ivoire. Cote d'Ivoire is also a bicameral parliament with a Senate located in Yamoussoukro and a National Assembly located in Abidjan. This is a consolidation of both chambers of the Ivorian parliament to be able to reach this result. At sixth position is the parliament of the Gambia, the parliament of the Gambia. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, and the, uh, our, our friends from the Gambia are receiving some applause here in the room, uh, the parliament of the Gambia. And I must say that it's one of the parliaments that is making a lot of efforts towards openness, a lot of efforts towards openness. Um, currently in the parliament of the Gambia, you can go onto their Facebook page and watch virtually every committee proceedings live on Facebook. Uh, you, can, you can have citizens engaging. They have a very proactive public affairs you know, unit that is you know, entertaining engagement. And we must note that the parliament that we measured is only the first parliament after the dictatorial reign of Yaya Jame. And so the current parliament now is only the second after the Jame era. And so it's, it's not a bad performance. Uh, but still below 50%, uh, which, is, which means that there's still more room for improvement. The fifth is the National Assembly of Benin. The National Assembly of Benin. 
you would observe that this is the best francophone legislature. You would observe when we go up that the Beninois parliament is the best so far as the francophone countries are concerned. Uh, one of the parliaments that have actually signaled that they will take the results of this index seriously, the president of the National Assembly himself, you know, having assigned people to be in this meeting and to take up the, the, the results and to work with civil societies, Social Watch Benin and the rest of the civil society network members there for transformation because they hope that by the time the next index comes up, they should have shot much higher. A fourth position is Nigeria. The bicameral parliament of Nigeria, a two-chamber parliament also. So this is a consolidation of the two chambers of the Nigerian legislature. Uh, they score below 50%, 49.21 to be specific, uh, which still shows that there's still a lot more room for improvement so far as parliamentary openness is concerned in Nigeria. At number three, and I had uh, Honorable Okujeto Ablakwa uh, uh, say it loud that Sierra Leone will be number three. I'm not too sure if he got it right. But at number three is the Parliament of Sierra Leone. It's the Parliament of Sierra Leone. Um, the Parliament of Sierra Leone at third scores 57.97. So the third best parliament in West Africa scores just 57.97%, which, you know, a lot of good work is happening in Sierra Leone, I must say. A lot of good work is happening in the Sierra Leone parliament. We know that they are receiving a lot of support from the from development partners like the European Union, like the Westminster Foundation for Democracy, like... Um, the, the UNDP towards a lot of transformational agenda. And I was particularly surprised when during their Open Parliament Day, the Sierra Leonean Parliament actually announces reports to citizens. It provides its annual report based on the performance of its strategic plan and citizens are able to know where they are on the strategic plan, which has also been nicely developed. And I spoke about a few other examples that could be learned from Sierra Leone. So now we have two more countries. Um, in the top two, Kevet, Ghana, and I mentioned them, of course, in order of alphabetical order. So Kevet is C, Ghana is G, uh, in alphabetical order. One is Anglophone and one is Lusophone. Uh, of course, we saw the other Lusophone country, which is the other Portuguese-speaking country, place 13th, which is Guinea-Bissau. Um, but we have the other Lusophone country in the top two. So at second position, ladies and gentlemen, is the parliament of Kivet. Now, if you do the maths, so if you do the maths and you add, and you add the two, the three dimensional areas, Whereas Kevet won in one dimension, did a, a, a joint in, the, in another, and the gaps, if you put 35, the results of 35 plus the results of 35 plus the results of 30 together, the, the mathematics, sorry. Yes, yes, the mathematics, uh, 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 favored them. But you will see the difference between the overall score of Kivet and the overall score of the first parliament. So, of course, the second rated parliament, the parliament of Kivet, at 61.86. Then comes 63.03. <laughs> well, <laughs> 63.03, the Parliament of Ghana leads the pack. Of course, there are so many interesting innovations happening in the Parliament of Ghana, but at 63.03, it shows that there is still a lot, lot, lot more room for improvement. Uh, 
awesome parliamentary website and parliamentary application that provides a good amount of uh, information, um, access to parliament, and some of these indicators all in there. But there is still a lot of room for improvement because as you may see from the other dimensional areas, Ghana in public accountability, 14.32 uh, uh, out of a possible 30, less than half, 21 out of a possible 35 for um, civic participation, 27.71 out of a possible 35 for transparency. And so for these information that we have shared with you, you certainly can have access to them and I'll show you how, but this is how it all plays out so far as the overall country scoring is concerned. This is how it all plays out so far as the overall country scoring is concerned. The regional average, West Africa regional average, is a 44.36%, which means that at the regional level, we are not doing well at all. And if you look at 44.36%, it means that apart, I mean, right from Cote d'Ivoire downwards, every other country there scores below the regional average while those from the Gambia and above falls above the regional average. Yet, the Africa Open Parliament Index, West Africa edition, is being led by a parliament that scores at 63.03%. We want to emphasize that there is so much room for improvement. And like we said from the very beginning, the intention for this is to identify the gaps, and we are hoping that parliaments will open up to work with civil society especially the networks of PMOs and other civil society organizations to do specific tweaking so that by the time the next index is launched in the next two years, we can be able to see a very good result. We are hopeful that perhaps even before the next two years, we may be able to have the right partnerships and engagement uh, with our friends in East Africa, Southern Africa, to see how those other regions also fared against us, whether their regional average are better whether they are the best in those regions will perform better than the best in, in West Africa and what have you. For those of you who are online and those of you who are in the room, a simple login into www.parliamentafrica.com forward slash OPI gives you all of these details that I have retreated here. And another thing that it gives you is an opportunity to pre-request pending next week's release of the full report, the full report of the index, the narrative report that gives all of the details. And like we have also indicated, it provides contact details for any national assembly, civil society, media that wants specific areas, the back end information to it for your own independent analysis. Because we believe that if we are measuring parliamentary openness, then the process itself must be open, must be transparent, and what have you. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all very, very much for your kind attention. I'm sure that uh, this resource, as we have it on our board, will send some, you know, thoughts around in our heads to see how well we are doing or how well we are not doing. Thank you so very much. Yes, I'm leaving it actually on the screen for a while. Yes. I'm leaving it on the screen for a while. So thank you so very, very much. I'm sure that we can allow a few moments for some, you know, uh, quick comments. Uh, we see that there are uh, uh, some persons who may be online, a member of parliament here, a civil society in the room. Maybe we will just do, Cynthia, the next couple of minutes because we've already taken some time of, yes, too much time of our guests. Thank you so very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. And yeah, we won, but uh, more room for improvement. So just some few comments. Uh, Sam, uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is a very comprehensive one. I would like to recommend moving forward that over time as civil society, when we sit behind parliament, watch television, and also listen to the news, uh, the beauty of our democracy is indeed uh, a testament for others to learn, especially when you see Honorable Okujetu criticizing the faith, and also our uh, uh, second deputy speaker, also our first deputy speaker, 
also uh, 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 defending in faith shows that our democracy has gone uh, to another level. So moving forward, my recommendation is if we could also get some model, if we can write our examples as a model, and then how it has sustained to this level so that others can also learn. Moving forward, I think it will also help us. And the collaboration that we see here, our community that we serve, don't even see that Honorable Kujetu and First Deputy Speaker will sit and even laugh. That is the beauty that we would like the general public to know so that some of these interactions can help moving forward. The final thing is I believe uh, we're also not going to make this a partisan scoring, that it was in my tenure that we scored the best. We should rather see this as an institutional building so that the benefit goes to the two stronger political parties because ultimate, uh, ultimately they are going to alternate whether it is going to break the eight or the eight has already been broken. Uh. I think now we we'll give Honorable Lokuje to Ablakwa to make some comments and remarks. So, Honorable, see you play. You have the floor. I would like to commend civil society for putting this together. Uh, the output clearly has been worth all the, uh, the toil, the struggles, and the sacrifices. This is tremendous work. Uh, I mean, to uh, assess parliament in the sub-region and to actually take all the trouble and visit those countries, talk to key officials, and carry out an independent assessment. It's no um, light a task. And so I'd like to commend you uh, for the work uh, you have done. And I would also like to uh, congratulate colleagues uh, for emerging the uh, best parliament in West Africa, uh, except that looking at the score uh, of some 63%, it shows that there is still a lot of work that we have to do. And considering the image that we have as a democratic nation, uh, it is clear uh, to me that we would have to do a lot of hand-holding in all humility and support uh, other parliaments in the sub-region. Um, it is not really the best to uh, be at the top and then there's a yawning gap uh, with um, colleagues in the, in the sub-region. Particularly when we have the ECOWAS parliament, we have the Pan-African parliament, and one of the uh, objectives has been to help each other to grow and to deepen democracy uh, on the continent. If you have a situation where, uh, apart from uh, what the top five, everybody else is below average, it tells you that um, it tells you that really uh, there's a lot of work uh, to be done. So. When we go back, I'm sure that these are some of the discussions we'll be having with Mr. Speaker, with our colleagues who are all passionate. The first deputy speaker, as you know, is a member of the Pan-African Parliament, a long-standing member, and has been uh, very effective. He always will bring us reports uh, from their proceedings, we'll, we'll debate, we'll analyze, we'll deliberate on those reports. And it is clear uh, from the reports that we have uh, been uh, deliberating upon, that what he's been telling us is really the case, looking at your report. It's very, very consistent. The last time, it wasn't easy at the Pan-African Parliament. We also the the images that went viral. So we, we really have a lot of work to do by way of, you know, supporting uh, sister parliaments to... Uh, also deep in their democratic practices. My final comment will be on your methodology. Uh, listening to you carefully, I noticed that it's largely civil society assessment and then talking to the various uh, parliamentary officials, but there was no interfacing with the people. Uh, I would have thought that when you enter a country, if you just did some 
whatever method you want to use, um, if it's focus group or just some quick survey, just to find out what the people, because we're only representing the people. Um, it's, it's really about what the people perceive, you know, their perception, uh, what, how they, they see the parliaments. And I'm not talking about the, the, the individual MPs. No, you don't need to go to their constituents. Not, not that. Just the perception about the institution, you know, uh, across the partisan divide. How do they see their parliaments? Are their parliaments being responsive? Are their parliaments really meeting in their hopes and aspirations? I just think that probably moving forward, if you may want to add that, um, who knows? Because um, what civil society may think, or you, civil society makes the effort. They're always knocking on our doors. They are always, and you, you have a better insight of you know, a lot of matters than the average citizen in, in every country. And as for the officials, we are in there. We would largely try to you know, defend our work and what we do within the institution. So I just thought that if we could probably add that moving forward, it may help enrich. I know it may come with more uh, <laughs> budget requests, uh, but uh, who knows? After this um, impressive work, you may have more partners coming on board to support you to fund this. And we ourselves as parliaments, I mean, we may want to consider supporting you, ECOWAS Parliament, Pan-African Parliament, because it helps us. It's peer review. And uh, uh, this is something that really should be sustained moving forward. So those are my thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable. Um, our last fiscal participant to make a comment will be Madam. Thank you very much, Cynthia. All right, Cynthia says I should come this way. I just wanted to say that um, uh, thank you very much, Sami, and the network for a fantastic job. Well done and for a superb delivery. Um, I came from another launching of a corruption report uh this <laughs> this morning that Shraj and Shraj and GSS are trying to navigate around the issues of perception to actual experiences. And so exactly. And so, <laughs> and so when Honorable speaks to the fact that we want to also hear citizens' experiences of their MPs, I think it's apt. It's it's only uh, just that we also hear what the citizens think and uh, of their experiences of their various MPs. In that, I just wanted to uh, say that we did some work in the past where we looked at the issues around open government and so participation, accountability, and uh, the issue of transparency, uh, looking at the issues around legislation, so in law and then in practice. We realize that in Ghana, when we talk about the issues around legislation, they are bound. And so you will take all the boxes and that is fine. But when you come to looking at oh, so okay. so when you are looking at um, the details around exactly what we are doing to practicalize our legislations, then there are issues. And so if we could be looking at the index based on the issues around legislations and law. So when you take accountability, you are looking at the various components of accountability, public accountability. You are talking about citizens being able to access their MPs at every level, at the institutional and also at the personal level as an MP in the constituency. And then all the other indicators thereof. Then you can be able to uh, give the citizens a lot more information on exactly what happens when it comes to the issues. And in that regard, I can tell you that in the recent past, I have looked at the Parliament of Ghana website. In the past, I don't know, we are progressing, but then somehow they have decided to go back. There used to be MPs' contact numbers, MPs' email addresses on their website. I decided that, oh, one of my national service uh, guys in the office should go there and pick all the information because I wanted to share a document. He comes back to tell me, oh, it, those things are not there. And I was like, how? How is that possible? Oh, but we need to be able to have, you see, so that is, 
transparency. That is transparency, a basic one. And in, in that regard, I thought parliament had failed me. I have to call a clerk of parliament to get the committee members, their numbers and things. And that is that is not right. If we are talking about transparency, this, if, these are public officers. And we continue to say that I am taking the discussion to another level. <laughs> These are public officers. Their lives are open books. And so email addresses and uh, phone numbers, they should be accessible to us. I remember I needed to get in touch with Honorable Okujetu. At the time, I got a number from the website. But today, if you go there, it is not there. Are we going backwards, Sammy? You should notice some of those things. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, thank, thank you, Mary. Speaker wants to, you know. Make... Thank you, thank you very much. I, I, I read Mr. Speaker's speech, so I'll make my own observations. So, the first thing is that I think this is a major boost in the effort to evaluate Parliament from outside Parliament. I recall that uh, there was a publication that I think uh, Odikro was going to evaluate Parliament. There was um, a Ferrari in Parliament, and I said that rather than complaining, members should rather get involved in assisting um, developing the criteria, because whether you get involved or not, they will do it, and they're entitled to do it. Well, somehow that one fell flat. This one is an excellent one. I'll certainly give a report to the speaker, and I'll encourage that we put it on the floor of the house so members can read for themselves. The one which we fell below 50% is embarrassing to me, but it is also a part of the culture of Ghana. In Ghana, we insist that emoluments are private, don't we? Nobody discusses his or her income. Probably parliament should change the culture. Parliament should first. I have always had a problem where we, a parliament, are afraid to talk about our, because I hear so many things which are certainly not true. A lot of things people ascribe to members of parliament getting are false. But because we are not talking about them, as I said, uh, perceptions grow, they give wrong impressions. And so people have tended to make and peace their they are what we call the mediums, so to speak. Our phone call, uh, we published um, like a directory of MPs and 99% of the people who called me picked my number from that book. We're asking for personal assistance to provide them personal financial assistance. People are no, I don't know from Adam. And then, and then and Frosters also have joined in. They picked the information. Even yesterday, somebody was calling me from Dubai saying that the, uh, somebody is representing me in Dubai, saying that I have promised them job in Dubai. And so he was contacting me. That is how difficult the situation has become. But a real challenge you must deal with, deal with is how to let people understand that my job is to assist provide public goods, not personal support. That is what is killing us. Every one of us, if you ask, every one of the members of parliament spends not less than 30, 40% of his personal income salary to support people. You can help that, but there's a lot more demand on us. Probably that's why people are afraid to discuss. But then again, we talked about a common fund. Recently, I received a letter from um, somebody who says it's from APN, the fourth estate. And I asked, why are you asking me? Because I'm not a spending officer. There's a misconception that money is allocated to the MP or the MP's office. But that was the request that he wants me to give account of all the money that has been sent to my office from, by the common fund administrator. And I said, why are you asking me? Because I'm not a spending officer. I don't even know the account number where the money is put. The money, 5% or something, recently came down to 4%. 
is placed in an account managed by the uh, coordinating director. The MP's job is to say, use part of this money to do this or that for the company. There are rules. You can't use it for your personal things. You can't use it for outside the rules. So how they do the procurement, how they spend it, I'm only going to see that I ask you to buy roofing sheets for this community. And then you go to the community. Oh, have you received these items? Uh, you go and take your funds small. And then, <laughs> but beyond that, you have no control of how much, of course, parliament determines how much you come in the, uh, the, the formula. But how it is spent is not MP. But uh, unfortunately, the perception is that MPs have personal control over those men, which is not true. So beyond evaluating us, I encourage you also to engage members more. Sometimes we need to give you the information because there's a lot of misinformation out there about what MPs do. But I really, I truly wish to congratulate you for this exercise. We need to do more. We need to improve our score in our openness, in our personal uh, we take credit for a lot of things which have nothing to do with us. If you come to be quiet now, they are praising me because the roads have been done. Uh, well, it's a central government project, but it is my constituency, so I'll take credit for it. <laughs> if it is not done, they will deal with me. <laughs> so if it is done, I'm entitled to take credit for it. But if anybody expected that, I'll be able to make a drain, a 50 meter drain from all the monies that has paid in my name, Common Fund, for the last 12 years or 13 years. It's not true. It cannot do 100 meters of drain, you know, but because sometimes, I, I the last one, I had to call assembly members in my district and give them the letters for them to know that indeed this is the amount of money that is paid to the assembly because the assembly members themselves didn't know how much of the common fund was coming to them. So they also assumed that they had so much money. But when they saw the letter, they realized that they have to do more to raise revenue in the district if they are going to be able to do all the things. But once again, let me congratulate you for this exercise. It's a very worthy one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um